Okay, sounds like the music's fading out, and this is your substitute host for Nuked Radio, Patrick Penry. And I'm filling in for Christina Consolo, a.k.a. Radchick. And some of you may know me, some of you may not, but before I get started, I want to thank uh, Radchick for this opportunity. And it is both an honor and a pleasure because I realize how much time and energy is devoted to a radio show and building it up and making it your own. And so to turn that over to someone uh, for an hour, that's like letting them take your kid out to the movies that night, right? So hopefully I do uh, Christina Radchick proud today. And what we're going to discuss today is a very controversial subject, and that is the NRC Freedom of Information Act documents pertaining to the Fukushima meltdowns. Now, I'm not going to be discussing the uh, meltdowns themselves. A lot of people have spoken of that, and that's out and in the open to some degree. But what I will cover is the orchestrated uh, cover-up that is proven inside of these documents. And you really get a broad feel for just how these, like if you go back to the BP oil spill and, and you guys look into that, you know there was a no-fly zone and the uh, blackout and the mainstream media gave their version of the story. Same kind of thing happened with the cover-up of the uh, radioactive plume and cloud from the Fukushima meltdowns. And so quickly I want to brief over, I took some notes last night, I said to myself, what what have I learned from these documents from reading so many thousands of pages? What, what is it I would want to get across to uh, Radchick's audience uh, while I have this opportunity? So let me briefly go over what I have learned from these documents pertaining to not just the cover-up now, because there's a lot of other interesting information you can glean from reading through the Freedom of Information Act documents. Now, one of the important things early on, I realized that they were suppressing and covering up, but that you could read in these documents a lot of detail about just the extent of the damage at Fukushima, how serious it was, the catastrophe, and in fact, uh, the Japanese forces' inability to respond quickly and effectively. Okay, and that's something they don't want you to know about nuclear power, that when a big one happens like Fukushima, you know, sometimes the rads are so high or the entryway is blocked due to debris, you can't even access the plant to begin to rectify the situation. So that's a serious concern that's revealed in the documents and it's much suppressed by the NRC and the authorities here in the United States. And, and that's just briefly to cover that. We'll come back to that into more detail. Secondly, obviously the cover-up. Okay, when you look in these documents, you see just who all was involved. And it's a very broad involvement. I'll read you quickly some agencies involved. And, and indeed, it's at first when I got into the documents, I said, well, this is a, you know, a United States cover-up. But it's more than that. It was global because it involves obviously IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency. You'll have to have like WHO, the World Health Organization, downplaying the results of these catastrophes. So uh, quickly, obviously NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the DOE, the EPA, the CDC, HHS, DHS, FEMA, USAID, DOD and Navy Naval Reactors, the White House, President Obama, and he, he called for a worst case scenario, so we know he had an idea what was going on. Corporate-wise, you had Bechtel and GE were involved, and then, like I said, the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Association, INPO, International Nuclear Power Plant Operators, if I got that right, and the NEI, National Energy Institute, which had a password-protected database where the rooftop grabs from our nuclear power plants here in the United States, when they picked something up, unless it was super low and minuscule, it was forwarded up the chain of command to a password database. So part of what's really big in this is just the size and scope, the staggering uh, scope of this cover-up when you look at who all was involved and and when you compare that again to the fact when we begin to look at the thyroid study coming in by Sherman Mangano, I'm sure Radchick has touched upon that. And if you look at the initial assessment of the fatality index study by Sherman Mangano, and also Bobby One's got a very detailed in-depth uh, study that goes forward to the year 2030, where he's projected 1.3 million American fatalities. So you, you put that in line with the cover-up and you see just that the fact that human lives are being sacrificed to protect industry and many of you already know children's cells divide at a higher rate that's why they talk about children thyroid doses in the documents and they're very concerned about that and there's plenty of evidence they were modeling for the united states and alaska and midway and california so on and so forth 
Okay, also in the documents, they mention a number of times that they have the benefit of knowing all about Chernobyl. Okay, and the premier study on Chernobyl is the cost and consequences uh, study. Uh, let me bring it up here on my screen real quick. Chernobyl, consequences of the catastrophe for people and the environment. And this is on file at the annals of the New York Academy of Sciences. And so in the documents, when they say they, they have the benefit of knowing all about Chernobyl, that's what they know. And when you look at that study and look at the fatality projections for Chernobyl, well, it's over 900,000, right? Because it's not just the initial blast people died, it's latent cancers that really kick in. Now, I remind you at Fukushima, unit number three was a MOX fuel. And when you read about that, it's extremely dangerous because it's carried aloft in aerosol, a gaseous form. And that's what we worried about our uh, Navy ships and our sailors who were in the close proximity at the time. So they know all about Chernobyl. Now, they're not going to act on that knowledge. This is about a cover-up, Three Mile Island cover-up. There's a cover-up in Chernobyl by Russian authorities. We even had a saltwater reactor here that I've heard was a cover-up. We had a meltdown. And a lot of people don't know that the a Navy had a purposeful some 13, 14, 15 odd meltdowns in Utah back in the 80s and late 70s just to test and see what happened in a meltdown. Also, Although the NRC and our authorities say potassium iodine is not a big deal, you don't really need to have it, you know, don't sweat it, not to worry about it. All throughout these documents, boy, are they sweating potassium iodine. They're shipping hundreds of thousands of units to the Japanese. If one of the NRC leaves his doses at home, there's a big stink about it. Hey, he left his doses, get him some more doses of potassium iodine. So whilst on the one hand, they tell us over here, no, nah, we're not a big deal. We don't stock it. And it's just one, it only protects you against iodine anyway. On their trip to Fukushima, they ain't leaving without potassium iodine. Okay, also, I've got an article on the Navy ships and RADs and where I discovered a couple documents that show what looks like they had plenty of foreknowledge they should have moved our Navy ships and sailed them uh, west into the wind. And when you look at these documents, clearly they were running worst case scenarios. They were modeling a worst case scenario, but they never acted on a worst case scenario. And that's one of the big things I push out there because whilst our sailors are suing TEPCO, I've got a couple documents with evidence that I'm asking to be forwarded to these sailors that show, hey, it looks like Navy reactors and NRC and admirals had a pretty good idea they should have moved those ships. But to protect the nuclear industry, you know, if you move the ships, if you make any move to admit there's a problem or take countermeasures, again, that's admitting there's a problem, and they, and they cannot do that. They can't. If many of you will remember, the Surgeon General, right after Fukushima, came out and said, you might want to have potassium iodine, might not be a bad idea. Then a couple hours later, she came back out again in the press to say, I made a mistake, now nah, you don't really need it. It was almost as if she got a phone call, so that's the way some of these things work. Response to nuclear catastrophe is inhibited in particular, the ability to speak freely and communicate openly because participants know they're being recorded and their email saved. Throughout these documents, they make references to the Freedom of Information Act uh, that we're being recorded, you know, cut the conversation, you're getting a little too carried away. Two guys are having a conversation about the melt through, sublimating through the concrete down to the torus, and the guy says, okay, guys, okay, you know, chill out there, we're being recorded. And, and, and this is a serious problem. If there's an incident in the United States, their ability to respond to that is going to be restricted simply because they don't want to be open and honest about the true nature of what happens in, in a major catastrophe uh, such as Fukushima. Also, I noted in the documents and had some information sent to me by another researcher that the NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, spends millions to search social media and online monitoring. They want to know what we're talking about them, what we're writing about them, what information we've discovered on them, and then they can go in and, and take countermeasures and have their bloggers beat it down, send their trolls and shills out to attack us in the threads and tell us we're wrong and what have you. And again, this is a huge, massive, orchestrated effort to do what? Control information, folks. That's what it's all about. They don't want you to know the truth of nuclear power and at what really happens when one of these major catastrophes goes down. Also in the documents, uh, there's, it's called the saga of the Bechtel pumps. And initially they had no way to, the water cannons they said were useless. Nothing's really happening there. It looks good on TV, but it's not very effective. And so they're trying to ship these pumps in from Perth, Australia. And I don't have all the documentation on this yet. I've got another researcher, Shazam, that's going to get me the uh, document and screen capture where 
it, it looks initially they would have just given the pumps and said, here, take the pumps and, and just get them to, to work and then try to cool the stuff down and, and, and maintain the situation. But in the end, our Department of Defense is ends up paying $9.8 billion for these pumps. Bechtel owns the pumps. They're profiting from it again. And, and indicative in the documents is certain places where they say, well, it started at 200000 and then the price went up and then it's millions and then it's $9.8 billion. And then I'm told reliably that there's a section in there that says they would have just, hey, just take them, get them, get them there and put them up. Who cares about the money, right? So it looks by all accounts, we got built for 9.8 billion uh, tax dollars. John Q. Taxpayer. Okay, condition of U.S. nuclear industry. It reveals also some information about the condition of our plants here at home. For instance, I have a video on YouTube about non-seismically uh, qualified spent fuel pools that Alexander Higgins picked up and uh, carried that one as well. And you see in this email, the guy says, President Obama's calling for a review of our nuclear plants, and he says, we got to make sure and tell them there's spent fuel pools that aren't seismically qualified, of which I recall there are many, the guy says. So if we have a severe earthquake, hey, some of our spent fuel pools aren't going to be able to withstand it. That could be a concern. And finally, and one of the big things I got out of this, maybe the biggest, okay, and that is the consortium, okay, which in the documents they say is the government and the industry grouped together to handle this catastrophe. But in the end, I find that the industry holds sway over government. They even say in the documents, and I'm paraphrasing here, but the guy says the industry will determine the federal role in this disaster. And that just blew me away when I read that because that, at that point I'm like, well, I've read about fascism and I know who Mussolini is. I know a little about Italy. My mom's talked about a little. But this seems to be a hyper form of fascism where the merging of the corporate and the state is going beyond that, folks. It's like Bechtel and GE and Dow and Monsanto and these huge corporations, transnational, bigger than any government. Governments don't really exist anymore. They're just there to do the, the will of these massive transnational conglomerations of corporations. And the co consortium is how I refer to them. So when I say consortium, I'm talking mostly that the industry, these huge, whether it be the nuclear plant industry or you know, Chevron, the, the fossil fuel industry or what have you, um, it doesn't matter. It's these huge corporations in and in, in, in the documents you see like, wow, shouldn't the government define the role? Shouldn't the people whose representatives go into uh, um, allegedly a republic and to represent us? And then when they get there, they don't really represent us because they're in contact with the consortium and the consortium, well, if you want to get reelected, right, and you're going to need their money and GE, as we all know, contributed heavily to Obama's campaign. So that in a nutshell, I'm just kind of going over uh, what I've got out of these documents and what you kind of need to know about it. I'm gonna come back into detail. I will read from some screen captures. Um, for instance, let me let me show you the one real quick about the, they don't wanna move the Navy ships because it's gonna cause them angst. You know, moving the Navy ships would be an admission beyond that 50 mile zone. And in the documents, you see the plume a chart of a plume headed to Tokyo, like 75 kilometers worth of a plume. They discuss 150 miles away. They're they're getting um, sensitive readings to be concerned about. And look in this particular one here. I'll read from the document. This is Admiral Donald. This is with PATCOM with the Navy. And he's speaking to a Mr. Burroughs, I believe is with the NRC. I'll have to check on that. Yeah, Chuck Burroughs. And Admiral Donald, this is in reference to the Navy ships and the plumes and the radiation. Admiral Donald says, and there's a name redacted here, he says, this is Kirk Donald. Just one correction on what you said there. The particulate levels that are being measured, the ones reported in the 2 to 7 by 10 to the negative 9th region, those are being taken on the USS George Washington that is currently located in Yokosuka, Japan, which is about 175 miles from the site. Don't worry too much about the numbers in this whole thing, folks, because what I would stress to you is that's a zeolite cartridge and it's only going to test for iodine. What you need to know is in the number three, unit number three, there is MOX fuel. And they, in these documents, they never talk about plutonium and they never test for plutonium. They test for cesium and iodine because of the short half lives and they never look into plutonium. But as we understand, it's an aerosol type form when one of these meltdowns occurs with a MOX fuel payload and that is something to be worried about. So they should have acted on a worst case scenario just based on that alone. Now, here's Mr. Burroughs' response. He says, actually, Admiral, this is Chuck Burroughs. What we saw was the plume on its way. 
So we saw the plume on its way. We are still measuring 2 by 10 to the negative 9th at this location 90 miles from the reactor plant, as well as now measuring 10 to the negative 9th down in the Yokosuka area. The plume is an extensive plume. I mean, I have readings at both locations that are above 10 to the negative 9th microcuries per milliliter as far out as Yokosuka and as far in as this 90 mile point. In another section of this document, there's a quick back and forth between two NRC guys, Charlie Miller and Marty Virgilio, and, Char and they're talking about running a worst case scenario and, and maybe having to move Navy ships. And Charlie Miller says, is if, if you're getting angst about moving naval ships and things like that, the worst case scenario isn't necessarily the one you want to run. And Marty Virgilio responds, right, Charlie, this is what we're all thinking, that there's, you know, you run at least two cases. Now, in the documents, it gets to a point where the guy says, I've, I don't want to hear about worst case anymore because there's so many worst cases now floating around out there. Don't even say the word worst case. You know, So what you see is they keep running a worst case until it comes back with the least number of source terms possible. In other words, the least amount of emanations from the disaster site where they can downplay it and say, well, you know, we've we've run worst case models. We're going to choose the least of these worst case models and we're going to promote that. Right. And, and then they still never would even act on anything as I thought they should, because when they test it, sometimes the models are only for three to five days of emanations. If it's only three to five days of emanations, hey, that's a real problem because I've just received information last night. A new report is coming out, shows plutonium in the Pacific, strontium in the Pacific. That's indicative that there's been a recent uh, fission activity to produce these particular elements. That's my crude understanding. Again, I'm not an expert on this. I'm just a you know, average Joe Schmo citizen that realized, hey, I'm going to get radiated to death if I don't get busy and try to do something to shut this uh, archaic industry down. And all of this is an energy monopoly, folks. It rides on the back of, of energy technology suppression. Um, I've got a number. I've got a, a photograph I took of uh, out of a book where the Union of Concerned Sci Scientists is talking about 5,000 plus suppressed patents in the United States alone. If your invention is more than 70% efficient or your solar cell more than 20% efficient, it's subject to restriction or seizure under national security. And I've got the actual USC title code. I could read it to you. If it, if it threatens their version of national security, which really means threatening their energy monopoly, your invention is not going to go to market. They'll, they'll seize upon it and restrict the patent. And if you try to privately produce it and bring it to market. It's very difficult to do so when no bank will finance you. Again, no bank will finance you. That seems to be the problem now. There's plenty of inventions. Many of you are aware of Stan Myers and his quote unquote water car, which uses electricity to split hydrogen away from H2O. And the hydrogen powers the, you know, just like a, I've seen in the back of a Dodge truck, like my truck. And the, the hydrogen gas is routed to the engine. It's highly combustible, more so than gasoline. The byproduct is oxygen. Okay. But that's not going to perpetuate this petrochemical monopoly that we're all putting gasoline in our car. So understand that like cancer, if a if a cure ever did show up, it would be seized upon under national security because so many jobs, again, and lives, livelihood somehow depends on this. Again, they're worried about what collapsing the system. And I say the system is one that's so negative now, you know, that might not be such a bad, bad thing, you know, if you think about it. Okay, let's go into uh, quickly. I want to discuss again the extent of the damage. This is very important. You realize they're hiding this from you. They don't want you to know that they knew for weeks there was no water in the spent fuel pool number four. And I had a screen capture up on my WordPress blog that when I went back, it disappeared. Well, that was the one where they discussed the melt through and spent fuel number four down to the torus. The guy said, look, it's been without water this long. It's going to melt down through the concrete, sublimate through the concrete. And when it hits that torus, there's going to be a big release. Like, oh, they're really worried about it. I think that might be the one where the guy says, hey, calm down, chill out, guys. You know, they know they're being recorded. Don't get carried away. Well, they don't want you to know that. They don't want you to know that. And the Mark I containment system, my understanding is the spent fuel pool reservoir is on the top of the building. It's above everything else, right? It's, it's that brilliant of a, of a design. And if you think about the Mark I containment, think about it like Ralph Nader's old Chevy Corvair that he complained about, right? He had a, a mission to let people know the Corvair is extremely dangerous. It's, it's not a very... Uh, 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 um, good design. It's a very poor design. People are being injured in it. And he went and tried to warn people about it. Well, the Mark I containment is 
kind of similar, except it's not easy to recall. You can't bring it back to the factory and put a new uh, electronic control module on it that easily. You have to send someone into the field. You have to make uh, modifications in the field. And early on, they had a problem with the Mark I where they said, look, we need to install this hardened vent. And again, it was a generic requirement. In other words, you can install it if you want, or if you don't, don't worry about it. You know, but They said you need this hardened vent to release pressure in certain circumstances to avoid a criticality. You might vent some radioactive material into the atmosphere, but you'll save a larger disaster. Well, a lot of virus to my knowledge, are not required to have that. I've got a, a screen capture that says it's a generic requirement on the hardened vent. So think of it like that old poor Corvair design, and that's indeed what they had in Fukushima. And worst of all, there's the massive amount of fuel located in spent fuel pool number four, and the fact that MOX was the payload in the number three. Now, quickly, I want to read from an article of mine where I talk about this, or I quote someone else, actually. I, I quote, quote a guy named... Praful Bidwai. He's an Indian, obviously, and he says, quote, Reactor 3 use, uses mixed uranium plutonium oxide fuel in the core. It's called MOX, M-O-X. According to Edwin Lyman of the Union of Concerned Scientists, quote, the use of MOX generally increases the consequences of severe accidents in which large amounts of radioactive gas and aerosol are released compared to the same accident in a reactor using non-MOX fuel. Because of this, the number of latent cancer fatalities resulting from an accident could increase by as much as a factor of five for a full core of MOX fuel compared to the same accident with no MOX. So again, I stress to people, they, they were running worst case scenarios. Obama even called for one that was a fair, other than that it was only for three to five days worth of emissions, but it was a three source term and two spent fuel pools, if, if I remember right, which is somewhat fair. And if you modeled it out for several months or you know a couple months at least, considering you have no water and the water cannons aren't working, then if you had acted on that, you would have had to make a further evacuation zone. 50 miles is it's good, and it broke all the records, I suppose, was at 10 miles before. But really, when we're getting a plume models out to 75 kilometers, readings at 150, and a discussion of a plume, and there's no testing for plutonium, okay? That's the kicker right there. I cannot stress that enough in these documents. There's a mention of MOX fuel, but not plutonium. Okay. As far as the extent of the damage, they had to bring in bulldozers to bulldoze over uh, dirt and rocks and debris and kind of cut what they call shine back, this incredible amount of radiation. In fact, there's a quote, lethal dose rates outside that building and the workers don't want to go in because they know they're not going to last very long. So to access the site, first you got to bring bulldozers in and they're talking about shielding on some Humvees, maybe hanging lead shields to try to get in there. What they're coming up with early on, you can, you can tell there's no quick fix. There's no quick fix and they haven't had a lot of practice at this either. So they're kind of winging a lot of it as they go along. The water cannons we know were ineffective. There's a lot of that on TV, but that was just for show. And in the documents, they're very clear on that, that it was minimal effect, if any at all. And I would add today, like I said a minute ago, uh, recently or last night, I'm hearing about a study coming out that shows plutonium in the Pacific uh, strontium 85 and 89, something like that. And, and this they're telling me is indicative of uh, recent fission. So if you think that those three to five days of emissions and then it stopped and you've nothing to worry about, wrong. Their models were based on three to five days. And even then some of, the, some of them came back with some uh, results to be concerned about. But if you had modeled it correctly for the long period of time as which these emanations are coming from, you have a quote unquote lube oil fire on the March 14th that they know is not a lube oil fire. They say that in the documents and they say when it's a fire and that smoke is the worst, according to the EPA.gov uh, protective action guideline manual I was reading last night, that's when a fire and that smoke goes up, boy, that's the worst, right? And that carries everything aloft. Okay, let's go into the aspects of the cover-up. I read to you who all was involved. It's multiple, eight, it's the usual suspects, right? Everybody already knows that the agencies are by and large in the upper levels corrupted and compartmentalized and indoctrinated in this particular system. But what's you know staggering is just the size and the scope of who all's involved. FEMA is told to stand down right off the bat. Let me read you this particular uh, memo here. And this is the... Uh, it's just a David 
This is the David Liu uh, March 12th memo. And I'll read from this memo where he, he says, deputies meeting at the White House with a significant focus on the nuclear event, continued monitoring to, this, monitoring to the situation. And then he says down here, he says, interaction with DHS, Department of Homeland Security and federal agencies, including plume plot, possible exposure models and monitoring on the West Coast. Then beneath that, it says FEMA has stood down and operating under normal weekend staffing. So despite the fact they know all about Chernobyl and they have all the benefit of knowing that, and even despite the fact you've got guys like um, Blumenauer, Congressman Blumenauer writing letters saying, look, if the, if the, if the China is putting all their dust and their uh, smoke and, uh, and what have you, waste stuff is floating through the air over here. And we're at, many people know we're actually testing for that over here. And they know we're getting blasted by China's, you know, waste and everything. He says, how come we're not expected that Fukushima is not going to affect us and we're in the Pacific jet stream? I'm not saying that perfectly well. I should try and find this bloom in our letter. But he questions the fact that we hit pollution is the word I'm looking for. Pollution from Japan, uh, from China hits us. Why wouldn't the Japan uh, effect hit us, especially being that the commercial pilots catch that uh, Pacific jet stream, they piggyback ride it coming back from the Orient to save fuel. So it's a very, and we had an explosion where the guy goes on to say it hurled parts and debris a mile away. So in that explosion, there must have been a substantial amount of material carried aloft in nanoparticulate and aerosol form. There's gases being released, xenons being released. Oh, it was quite a massive amount of emanations and is still ongoing as is my understanding. And there's a new report coming out as soon as we get a hold of that, we can post that up for you guys. I'm sure everyone's going to be talking about it. The latest report prior to that is the Sherman Mangano uh, thyroid study where they're showing that yes, we are thyroids have been affected from fallout from Fukushima. Here's the, let me read you the Congressman Earl Blumenauer of Oregon. Again, in 1986, Oregon issued rainwater warnings from Chernobyl. And look at the position of Chernobyl, not in the jet stream, a little more in the Northern Hemisphere. Oh, we really had to have gotten blasted. It's just be against all common sense to say there's no effect from Fukushima. In fact, like I say, the studies are coming in now, the mortality index studies, the thyroid studies, and it'll continue. We'll see rises in cancer. And they'll blame it on anything, and you know, but the environmental conditions, especially nuclear. So Blumenauer is writing to Lisa Jackson of the EPA. And he says, quote, I write to inquire about the potential risk to U.S. West Coast communities from the explosion and release of radiation from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear facility in Japan. In a region that is already breathing air pollution from China, my constituents are concerned about radiation contamination from the facility reaching the West Coast. While a number of experts have indicated that contamination in the U.S. as a result of the Japanese catastrophe is unlikely, I would like to better understand the agency's contingency plans and your plan for disseminating information to concerned citizens." End quote. Well, they weren't going to give a lot to concerned citizens. Let's take a look at the Brenner, Elliot Brenner memo from March 13th, which is sent to uh, 13, 14 different people. And he's just getting out to the Office of Public Affairs staffers. He wants them to know what the, what the game plan is. And here's what he says. Again, this went out March 13th, early on, and this is setting the tone for the cover-up. It's been a very hectic weekend and a good test of our crisis communication planning. And that is a friendly euphemism for our ability to cover up. Our ability to cover up. A good test of our ability to cover up. It's a nice way of saying that, isn't it? Crisis communication planning. Thank you to the headquarters folks who sacrificed their weekends and their sleep to come in. And thank you to the regional folks who fielded a number of calls about our response and the impact of the Japanese situation on our plants. Some things worked very well. The blog was a great way to get information out besides our standard press releases. And NSIR released access to YouTube and Twitter by midday Sunday so we could do more monitoring of what information was quote unquote in the public domain. As I've said, they spend millions to search media and the press to see who's taught mainstream as well, but anywhere and everywhere. And they want to be able to respond to that. It goes on to say, please take the time Monday morning to review all the press releases that went out and the blog posts as well. Please use these to guide any media response you provide. 
while we know more than what these say, we're sticking to this story for now. Stay tuned as the week unfolds. We anticipate staffing the Ops Center on a 24-hour basis, at least through Wednesday. Neil will be helping us out in that regard, and we may need to ask for further regional assistance if we need to continue the full court press through next weekend. And that full court press I put to you is a media suppression, information suppression, a full court press, full spectrum. The chairman has a hearing on the Hill on Wednesday morning, which will occur a lot of my time and may be the place where we really push out our message. Okay, and he goes on to say it's, it's a marathon, not a 50-yard dash, so on and so forth. But clearly right here when he says we know more than what these say, these press releases say, we're sticking to this story for now. Now, in regards to these press releases, I made some notes here from last night. Okay, I told you about crisis communication planning, just a nice way of saying covering up what really happened. And they've got a, a it's like a tri-point attack. Press release, okay, talking points, and questions and answers. And if you think about it, a press release, that's a one-way street, folks. That's They say something, and it's like watching TV. You can't yell back at Diane Sawyer or Brian Williams and say, no, that's not true. Al-Qaeda was built by the CIA and Pakistan ISI. You can't say that back to them. So it's a great way to say what you want to say and leave it at that and leave it at that. Talking points. Well, wow. We all know about talking points, right? This just tries to center and control the flow of conversation and what some, you know, what they want to discuss. Pretty obvious there. And again, where's the debate? Where's the open questions? It seems you cannot ask them in this country because the questions you know, Rad Chick or myself or Kevin Blanche or Miss Milky the Clown or Alexander Higgins, the questions we want to ask, they're not being asked by those who are able to act. Like, like for instance, in the uh, White House, in the press conference, when uh, Tony Snow or whoever the guy is comes out now and, and they're asked questions, those are very carefully controlled. That's a question and answer where, you know, those people, those press agents are likely prompted with the question to ask and they already know the answer. And that's, you know, Questions and answers, what can I say? Pretty self-explanatory. Um, let's see, also there's talking points, press release, and Q&A, okay? Those are the three ways they're controlling information. And there's plenty of talk in the NRC for you documents. There's a lot of discussion about they, they want everyone's story to be straight. And they use terms like alignment. We need to make sure we have alignment on this. We need to be on the same page, they would say. We need a consolidated viewpoint, they would say. They're worried about a diverging perspective. Okay, some of this you have to kind of, you know, the guy doesn't say, okay, we cover this up and don't talk about that. Okay, it's not that blatant, but it's pretty obvious once you get the big picture and read enough into these documents. Oh, it's really obvious what's going on. And, and the truth is, is winning out now in these studies that are coming out and grassroots word of mouth, that's going to spread. You're not going to be able to hide what Sherman and Mangano, these two scientists are doing. It's word of mouth. It will end time. This, just like it always comes out, unfortunately, maybe 10 years later, maybe too long, we have a meltdown over here or some incident over here. That's what we're trying to avoid. And again, I'm very clear. I'm not for safe nuclear power. I'm for systematically shutting down and decommissioning all nuclear plants, dry casking the storage, and releasing suppressed technology. I told you guys about thousands of patents being suppressed. If anything would compete with any of these monopolies, it's quashed immediately and you just don't go anywhere with it. Okay, there's a password protected database for rooftop grabs. Nuclear plants over here were detecting material from Fukushima, but they like to say that it's not of a level that would be dangerous or a health problem. But then again, I say you look at the studies and in these documents, when it really gets serious and they talk about measurements that aren't super low that they can talk about, that's when the redaction comes in. Now my understanding is in a court case, that redacted material can be viewed, can be viewed. So it's not totally out of the realm of possibility. We may one day get to uh, look into what's redacted in these documents and really serious measurements. Maybe someone slipped up and actually said, okay, again, like I say, they know they're being recorded. They know about freedom of information. The emails are being stored. The phone conversations are being recorded. And as time goes on, people who weren't down with the plan early on, they kind of figure it out and say, hey, you know, now I know not to say so much and keep my mouth shut. I got an example where the, the guy is trying to avoid actually saying president's worst case scenario 
And so he's talking about the everything, the everything scenario. And the guy says, you're talking about the presidents or the California? And the guy says, yeah, he didn't really want to say it, but because, you know, it's like a Homer Simpson doe kind of moment, you know, doe. I'm trying to avoid saying presidents worst case scenario. Here's the, here, let me read it to you. I got it right here. Now, Brian, got it. Just kind inaudible add to the inaudible sometimes when i say inaudible that's they, they they play the tape back they conveniently sometimes can't hear what the guy's saying just kind of inaudible add to the inaudible the wind shift is that still in the forecast male participant sometimes it's a male participant you don't get the full name i don't know why you think they would be proud to have their name associated with nuclear power right male participant right brian did we ever get the I'm trying to think of what the best term is, the everything, everything, inaudible scenario back from, I thought that was the one we were going to ask NARAC to run once they had time. Male participant, are you talking about the doses they saw all the way out in California? Brian, yes, that's the dough moment. Dough! Okay, we were trying to avoid saying doses out in California, right? We're being recorded, freedom of information. They're trying to subvert and get around freedom of information. It's very clear. And that's another thing in these documents. Like I say, they, they can't respond adequately because they're trying to subvert freedom of information. So they can't even talk about what's really happening. Okay. As far as the cover up, I just want to make sure I cover um, that, the, that basic, you know, we know more than this press release talking point. It's a huge aspect. There's so much to it. I've got a lot of screen captures and documentation. I've done a number of broadcasts on blog talk radio under Hattrick Penry unbound, and you can go in and listen to, I've got thousands of hits on my, uh, rads and Navy ships where the, you know, conundrum, um, leave Navy ships there or and protect nuclear industry or move them. And then everybody knows it was ultra severe and they, you know, they're already on edge about nuclear power over here now since Three Mile Island. There's a cover up in Three Mile Island. A lot of people don't know Department of Energy was the big player in that. And they say, well, there's no emissions and nothing that would harm human health, but they would settle out of court for over a million dollars to a family with a Down syndrome kid. So that for me is, you know, indicative enough that they knew there were emissions. They knew it, it affected some and they had a family had a Down syndrome baby and then they had to pay one point something million out of court settlement and hush it up, up, don't talk about it. In Chernobyl, same thing. Massive cover up neighboring countries, nuclear power plants detected emissions made the phone call to the Russian embassy and said, hey, what's going on? And speaking of embassies, you know, Ambassador Ruse, our ambassador to Japan, he was denied certain plume models. He said, he said, hit me with something that's not so nice and easy. I'm paraphrasing. He said, give me a worst case scenario. They didn't want to do it for him. In fact, there's documentation here where China is denied a plume model because they say, well, if we give it to China, then we got to give it to all the other nuclear power plant operators and the states referring to the United States. They'll want to see that plume model too. Okay, now that's just a big red flag right there because if it's so innocuous, if it's not going to harm us, you would just reveal everything, right? There wouldn't be, wouldn't withhold plume maps and you wouldn't, you know, withhold documentation from the ambassador or from China or from whoever. You would share freely your information knowing that, you know, really the situation's not that bad as we said. And hey, everyone come have a look. There's nothing to hide here. But then you see this massive concerted orchestrated uh, cover up to hide and downplay the cloud, the radioactive plume and the effects of. And might I add, when you look at some of these studies, if you go in and, and you look at Chernobyl, first of all, they say the trolls and shills will say, well, it's not from Fukushima, it's, you know, bomb testing or whatever. Well, that was shot down early on when they used the quote unquote Fukushima fingerprint, even Fairwinds, Arnie Gundershill sites got that on there. And you can go in and look and say, hey, they, they've proven that the, what the West Coast was bombarded with was from Fukushima as a particular fingerprint. Now, when you look at the fatality index studies, uh, there was one done also during Chernobyl in the United States, and there was one done after Fukushima by Sherman and Mangano. And if you compare that to what I call the Chernobyl Fukushima bird study, this is linked on Uncovering Plumegate, which is a WordPress blog. You can watch the scientist video where during Chernobyl, he was studying birds on the West Coast in the mountains. And during Fukushima, he was studying birds on the West Coast in the mountains. And the effects were the same in the fatality index rate, the deaths of the baby birds, because the baby birds would eat the leaves that the cesium and iodine and plutonium and 
strontium uh, land on and then when the insects eat that and then the baby birds eat the insects and then that's the end of the story there's a very high mortality amongst the baby birds and this was not just chernobyl but the same thing happened during fukushima so so we know that it's from fukushima we know we've been affected by it i tell people even without the FOIA documents considering what we know about three mile chernobyl etc etc really for France to give rainwater warnings and we didn't give any for Taiwan to send school kids home when radioactivity was 10 times the amount in the rain here in California okay that's a problem that means that the fascist the corporatocracy is more concerned about profits and we're going to need to know basis and if it affects profits we don't need to know let me read you a screen capture of a title of an Alexander Higgins blog article who he published some of my stuff back in the day it was very controversial people don't want to hear about Fukushima and people don't want to hear about people that don't want to talk about the NRC documents in this cover-up contained within but Higgins did publish me and the title of this article is confirmed EPA rigged radnet Japan nuclear radiation monitoring equipment to report lower levels of Fukushima fallout and how he discovered that is if you looked at the baseline prior to Fukushima and then after they rigged it it actually dropped to below what the original baseline was okay that's how much of a misadjustment they made and they went too far and if you look further into this you find the whole radnet system was pretty much underfunded under maintained and underrun it was a George Bush crony I can't remember her name but it was I've seen a picture of the building it was run out of you you would think it was abandoned or something right so it plays into their hands to not have all their monitors functioning at any given time to be able to uh, recalibrate that's a you know friendly way of saying rig the monitors right and so they so although EPA was and DOE were kind of heading up especially EPA the monitoring over here they weren't about to say anything and you guys probably already know all about EPA and FDA and those guys again like I say most of these alphabet agencies were compromised a long time ago okay that quote about the JFK and the ruthless and monolithic conspiracy he knew about it back then in the 60s before many of us were even born okay I talked about that we have the benefits of knowing about Chernobyl let me read you this one little a screen capture here from the FOIA documents where they say that he says again male participant we don't get to know who this person is but that all could be found when indictments are issued and people are hauled into court in question male participant we know about Chernobyl and if we were to have inaudible where we are today and US citizens in the U Ukraine what would we have told them we've got the benefit of knowing everything there is to know about Chernobyl how far out would we inaudible what would that be roughly consistent with the recommendation we would have made then okay and to some extent they may even be questioning that 50 mile evacuation zone and like I say I've seen enough evidence of plume charts and and monitoring 150 kilometers out that you know indeed the the evacuation zone in my opinion again it's just my opinion at least 100 miles out and there's soldiers and sailors well within that area that plutonium again if you're just going to check for iodine a very short half-life okay in a device that might not be that accurate meanwhile the plume drifts from here to there and the concentrations vary like if you were to have a campfire and you're testing for smoke when the fires blow into the north and you're testing to the south of course it's going to be a lower reading right and that's a lot of ways they can get get around a some of these uh, tests and samples and measurements that would have been worrisome and, and quite high so they know all about Chernobyl but they're not going to act on it and again I refer you and there's a link to this on uncovering a plume gate my WordPress blog and you can go read from the annals of the New York uh, Sciences Academy that particular study uh, which is titled consequences of the catastrophe for people and the environment it's by Alexei Yablokov and the Nestorinko couple of Vasily and Alexei. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but there it's an excellent, very thorough study that is the methodology and the results are congruent with what we find what we're finding now. And it's also congruent with that guy's bird study. See, humans and birds all suffer from radiation. And while we're two different, you know, beasts we're talking about here, to some degree we can compare. We can compare with a Chernobyl they say, oh you can't compare with Chernobyl but that's not entirely true and in fact this was my mom sent me this little clip right here you guys would be interested to hear this the Hiroshima bomb contained hundred and forty pounds of uranium 
Chernobyl had 360,000 pounds. Fukushima Daiichi has 3.5 million pounds of nuclear fuel. And part of that, again, is the mox of plutonium, the most deadly substance known to man, in aer aerosol form, carried aloft by the Pacific jet stream. And, and the effects were wide ranging. And that's just a fact. The cover up was also wide ranging. I told you guys, and we discussed earlier about potassium iodine in the documents. There's plenty of indication that they take that very seriously. They are not leaving for Japan without their KI, period, end of story. And if you forgot it, you better express that to me as fast as you can and let me pick some up from someone else who's got some extra stuff when I get there. Okay, so don't let them fool you. That's a serious uh, issue that needs to be addressed in the States because if we have a meltdown, and again, you look in the documents, you find out just how that response would actually be. It may be a sheriff having to come out to your house and knock on your door and say the nuclear plant's melted down. You might want to know. Okay, it could be that, um, what's the word for it, primitive of a means of establishing contact. Maybe you don't have a phone. Maybe you live out in the woods. Not everybody. There's a guy who lives on the Santa Fe. He's, uh, uh, well, he's naked, actually, but he doesn't have any phone and he lives off the land, right? How are you going to get a hold of, um, what do they call him? Ed, I think is his name. And he lives out there on the Santa Fe. He's a, what's the word, a hermit, right? How are you going to get hold of him? The sheriff may actually have to come out. So that also comes out in the documentation as well. It's not going to be, there's no quick fix. And in a big one, wow, it's really severe. They can't even get water in to begin to cool it. For on the 24th of March, ladies and gentlemen, they're still discussing uh, rewiring circuit boards and other electronics that were inundated with salt water. When you have a tsunami, think of the debris pushed around, number one, and then the inundation of salt water into electrical components. There is no easy fix, even if you have backup diesel generators. And even if you routinely test them, you have backups to those because the the task force that went there had a recommendation that you would want an offsite backup as well. You can have backup generators at the nuclear power plant, but if the catastrophe is so severe that those are damaged or there's too much radiation on them, you can't even use them. You have to have a backup to your backup. And again, with nuclear power, this is par for the course how dangerous it is. You don't hear this kind of talk with solar panels, do you? Really, you don't. Solar panels, the worst that could happen is it might shatter and you get a piece of glass in your eye, I suppose, right? A solar panel could fall on your head and crush you at the warehouse, I guess. But comparatively speaking, this, you can't even compare the two. Again, with solar power, what's the problem there? You or I can convert our own home into a electricity producing plant and sell it back to the power companies, thereby bypassing their monopoly. And that's why they restrict and limit solar technology and force nuclear power on us that we can't replicate. We wouldn't want to if we could, but Trust me, you can't in your backyard or in your garage have a, uh, a controlled nuclear uh, criticality and heat water and turn a turbine with it. It's just not going to happen. Okay, I was very clear about the two documents, and I've got this article on my website on uncovering Plumegate and on my WordPress blog where I talk about the Navy ships and the, the plume, the rads, the measurements, and the fact that they said, look, we're running worst case scenarios. In fact, we got so many of them now, the guy didn't want to talk about worst care case anymore, but they're not going to act on them. They're not going to act on them. So the whole thing to me, for me, that's like negligence. Knowing the plutonium, knowing about the mocks, knowing you're only checking for iodine, knowing the plume moves all around, and you, you decide to just take the chance. They will leave them there. They probably won't get sick. We'll protect nuclear power. And now, now we know that our sailors are suing uh, TEPCO, and it's just incredible. It's incredible because uh, TEPCO is, a, they're, yes, they're liable, but they're to some extent going to be the scapegoat uh, to keep the a diversionary type thing when Navy, Navy reactors, Admiral Willard, Admiral Donald, these guys had a pretty darn good idea that we should have been trucking our ships to our sailors and our ships to the west. You could have sailed into the winds to the west. Patrick, President Penry would have sent them around the world. I said, just sail west around Cape Horn, I suppose, is safer than getting blasted with the nuclear radiation. You know, some of the female sailors at the time could have been pregnant. And so the amount of rads to the pregnant woman is greatly reduced. 0.5 is my understanding if you work at a nuclear power plant. You're a pregnant woman. Hopefully you're a woman and you're pregnant. And you're pregnant and you're exposed at 0.5 rem. And that's one of their measurements. They send you home. You don't come back while you're pregnant. That's too much. So in all these modeling, and let me read you. Let me dig back into these documents. Let me read you. Uh, from some some of their modeling and some 
numbers that they're going to throw out there. Now let me back up here. I want to tell you about the uh, Jim Wiggins quote, the PAR protective action requirement, I think looks good. And we'll let you know about these NARAC, N-A-R-A-C. NARAC is under DOE, I believe, and they do plume modeling. They can model fires and forest fires, but they can also model um, criticalities and emanations, radiological emanations from a meltdown. And so he says, We'll let you know what these NARAC, what the president's run results in California, Hawaii, and those places. Another reference. What's the president's case, he says. Male participant. It's bounding. It includes the fuel in the three reactors, the fuel in four spent fuel pools. It does not include the common spent fuel pool around unit four, nor reactors five and six, or any spent fuel pools there. And it's assumed a release based over a four to five day period. Okay, and again, I told you that they won't check for plutonium and they want to make it short. Three to five days and check iodine or cesium or whichever one has the shortest uh, possible half life. Again, we are not being treated as humans anymore. We're like, not even, I wouldn't even say cattle because a, a cattle has some value to you. At this point, it's like the industry is placed on a, upon a pedestal so high that even the lives of children, women and children, but they wouldn't even tell them to stay out of the rain in California. They wouldn't even give any kind of advisor in France, as far away as France is, don't eat green leafy vegetables and stay out of the rain. I got a screen capture from a website that shows their actual advertisement with the woman and her child under an umbrella with the rain falling down and that nuclear yellow and black uh, symbol in the rain, telling you, even if you don't read the Japanese script or the or French or whatever, it's right there. So you can e easily understand what the graphic is about. Stay out of the rain, stay out of the rain. Well, we're directly in that Pacific jet stream and we didn't even get that for, not even for say pregnant women, stay out of the rain. Athletes don't practice out in the field while this aerosolized plutonium is coming through, if you don't mind. Okay, here's a, a quote from the NRC for you documents where the guy is, they're talking about, this is modeling again. And my understanding now is, and, and I'm learning more and more all the time, again, I'm, I'm becoming an expert, but I'm not an expert, that the child protected thyroid dose is, the number's gonna read higher because the thyroid is more susceptible. So it may look, the number may look worse, but that's because they're accounting for that it's more susceptible to an uptake. He says, quote, in Alaska, up to 35 uh, capital letters F-A-R rim for a one-year-old child protected thyroid dose. And that's for a northeast wind. And also up to a 6.4 in Alaska for the thyroid dose for the one-year-old for an eastern wind. And in Midway, if the winds are from or to the east, would show a dose up to 4.9 rims to the thyroid for a one-year-old child. Then he goes on to say, we're working through the interagency to understand and peer review those results. When the result came back that didn't look good, well, they got to review it and check it out. And, and I got a lot of stuff in there where they'll, they'll beat it down and they can move a decimal one place. And wow, that doesn't that make a difference, folks? <laughs> OK, here's another one where Mr. Zimmerman says, yes. And just to throw a value at you to let you know why the concern is so high is that the Trans America model guy from Scott out, that's a phonetic, that's the way it sounds, not necessarily the way that's spelled. Scott out is talking four and a half rims is a thyroid dose for infants in California. And my next screen capture shows dose equivalent to an embryo slash fetus from the US NRC website. And it's 0.5 rim, five millisievert is the maximum allowed. And that's what I base my my rhetoric and my dialogue when I talk to people. I'm an adult male, I'm older, it doesn't affect me as much. I, I try to go with the worst of the worst and say, look, it was the kids that affected the most. The thyroid study came back pretty much, and that's a lock as far as I'm concerned. The And these particular ones, Sherman and Mangano, if you guys Google them and look into them, their reputation is second to none. They're not industry scientists, they're not establishment scientists. No one's getting rich off of this, but we're trying to clean up the planet and restore some kind of proper living conditions and environment. It's never going to happen with nuclear power. It will never happen with nuclear power. It's such a concern to me as if I were president, once I had all the plants decommissioned and shut down and I released suppressed technology and said, we're gonna use our stand 
admires uh, water cars and our uh, Tesla devices, I would then look at China and say, you know, to me it's kind of an act of war if you build any more nuclear power plants. Because all it takes is one of yours to go up and we are affected many, many miles away. And I'm not about to lose a million Americans to you guys' power plant blowing up over there. You need to release suppressed technology along with us. Relax your grip. You can't have this much power anymore. We all die. You can still be a little more well off and have a little more control if that's your thing and that's what you want. And the conditions would greatly improve. It's kind of a two-fold process. You can't just take the nuclear power plants away and shut them down. You have to all, uh, offer an alternative. Right? And many people are totally oblivious to the fact that thousands here in America alone of patents are being suppressed. Ironically, my dad's a nuclear physicist and retired from the University of Florida, and he had a couple proposals with the George Bush administration and Obama administration for what I call a super battery that would work with your solar panels on your house storing your electricity. It's very efficient. And they would call him in and say, we're going to have a press conference, Dr. Muga, come in. My real name is Tony Muga. My dad's name is Dr. Lewis Muga from the University of Florida. And they would call him in and say, and other scientists too, and they'd say they have a press conference and say, we're looking into alternative forms of, of energy and we're, we're looking into to possibly financing and promoting this. And they would have a press conference and promote that. Then later, my dad would get a call back saying, hey, we're, we're going to decline. We're not going to do that. And we're not going to finance your proposal. And he would take the time to write out a detailed proposal. If you knew what he had to go through to do it, wow. Well, I'm pretty angry for him, even if he doesn't see what I see. And then they would call him back and say, well, we're not going to have the press, uh, the, we're not going to look into it. But they wouldn't have a press conference a second time to come back and fess up and say, look, we're not looking into this after all. We have no intention of financing or funding any uh, experimentation, exploration, R&D into alternative technologies, alternative energy, period, end of story. So and quite ironic, though, that my childhood was kind of, my dad taught, general chemistry and nuclear physics at the University of Florida for many years. So to some extent, I my food and my house and my home was paid for to some extent by nuclear power. So it's kind of ironic that now at this point in my life, I'm like dedicating myself like so many others that are standing up and doing this to, to try to bring some kind of a change. I we'll run out of time. I got three minutes left um, and I haven't heard any commercials. I just hope this is all going through uh, folks and you know, what I would say to, to sum up is, look, there's so much to know. Please go to Uncovering Plumegate, my WordPress blog, and or, and or to Hattrick Penry Unbound. I've got a blog talk radio broadcast I do, and I've got a website. A lot of this information I've condensed. I've brought it into a easily readable and understandable form, and then you can spread this amongst your friends and family and inform people, okay, and enlighten people. And because they simply don't know. Once I found out about nuclear power and the dangers of, hey, my life changed forever. It was no longer the happy-go-lucky. I can fool around and play games and have a good time all the time. I still play disc golf and I record music and play guitar, but I'm pretty much dedicated now until my last breath that you know, nuclear power, chemtrails, all that stuff's got to be handled, right? It starts right here in a grassroots movement. Again, I thank Radchick and Jules as well for this opportunity to speak to you guys and try to get this out there because this information has been suppressed and a few that have uh, spoken of it, we're just like anxiously awaiting everyone else to join us in promoting what we now know about Fukushima, the cover up, the extent of the catastrophe, and the whole nine yards. I mean, I got a whole list here. I'll publish my notes here that I took from last night as an article on my a website so you can go back down over this and I'll link to certain um, documents you can read what I'm reading for yourself in its entirety and so you can judge for yourself you know and read out of it for yourself and get out of it for yourself what you want don't just take my opinion for it or my assessment go in and read yourself and form your own uh, opinion on the matter